that the club without the fans is nothing. Our voice is unique. Well, we're all going down to the team, see all the black and white, all the smiling faces. Our voice matters. It's about the pride we have in our city, the pride we have in our area, and the pride we have in our team. Newcastle United belongs to the supporters. Our voice must be heard. The biggest asset Newcastle have is the fans. We have all... Hello and welcome to uh, the 1892 Pledge Scheme and the Newcastle United Supporters Trust presents an end of season talking. I tried really hard there to play our video, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen by now, um, uh, of, of promoting our, our 1892 Pledge, an ambitious fan-led project to um put money away to one day in uh ha have a stake in the club on behalf of the fans um don't think that went that well but i have uh i have teed up the other ones that one's just a very big file so i've i've teed up the other ones um in a more succinct way. Um, thank you so much for joining me this evening. My name is Charlotte Robson. I'm a board member of the Newcastle United Supporters Trust. Tonight, we have a very exciting couple of hours lined up for you. Um, we've got um, Alan Shearer joining us in probably about 15 minutes. So if you have questions for him, I'm gonna try and ask them about the season or about you know the pledge scheme and things like that. Um, please do pop them down in uh, on the chat I don't know where it is on what you're watching but um please do pop them down I'll try and ask um really excited to have him on board um and then and then we've got we've got um Keith Gillespie joining us Warren Barton will be joining us George Culkin and Ian Mins MP will be joining us we've got a couple of videos we're very very excited to chat through the season to talk about the pledge um and and just sort of and just sort of be here this evening so thank you for joining us um it's been kind of a crazy couple of months i think um we have um, had about 18 months of a takeover going on and on and on. Um, we've had um, we've had things like the big six uh, putting forward this Super League, which isn't the European Super League, to be clear. It's just the Super League. This is going to be, this plan was much bigger than just, just Europe. Um, highlighting, I think, so much how important fan um, involvement in clubs is because uh, as we saw across the country, um, fans getting really uh, upset about it, rightly so, not being um, not being consulted, being totally ignored, being told that they're legacy fans. I know a lot of you on Twitter have uh, tongue in cheek added that to your uh, Twitter handles. So, so yes, a uh, very, very busy time that has led to the fan-led review of football. So this is really important. It was part of the Conservative Party's manifesto. And Ian, who is one of the guardians of the 1892 pledge scheme, is um is is you know happy to talk about that. He's the chair of the all-party parliamentary committee on uh, on football. So so um I'm really excited to kind of talk through about that with him a bit later. So get your questions in. Um, um, so yes, just to highlight, tell your friends, Alan Shearer should be on <laughs> in about um, 10 minutes-ish time. Um, tell your friends, get your questions in, um, and and we'll see uh, we'll see about asking him some and chatting through the season with him. And then also, I know that so many people are going to have questions about the takeover and all of that stuff, um, and and things like. Um, things like the arbitration and all the news. So um, I'm sure that 
that George is the one that you'll want to ask those questions of. So I've allocated you guys a little 10 minutes or so to chat through. I'm sure George will be thrilled with me um, for doing that, but um, we, we'll, we'll hopefully get those out the way, um, chat through it, see what people think. Um, of course, fans are back in stadiums and that's so brilliant and exciting and even though the match on uh, on Wednesday was not great we were very excited to see you all back in the stadium um what else has happened Newcastle are safe so that's good is that enough do we want more of the same um you know things like that so so lots to talk about this evening and of course pop your questions in if you're watching on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube. Um, so uh, yeah, so do do get your questions in. We're probably about about ten minutes from um, from Alan Shearer joining us. So I can see that I've got George in the background. I don't know if he's ready to come in because I didn't tell him it would be this. Oh, he's nodding. Okay, I can add him. Um, all right. Hi, George. Thank you very much for joining me slightly earlier than I said, but I think people have probably heard enough of my voice. How are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you, Charlotte. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I was going to take good. a drink, but your question was, your answer was very short. <laughs> you, um, you were expecting me to give you a long, long list of ailments. Well, I mean, you know, you just just a little bit more um, exposition would have been great, but no, that's fine. Oh, okay. Um, how do you feel about the season in general? I'm sure we'll get very a lot more into it um, as the night goes on. But are you happy? We're safe. Does that make you? How do you feel? I'm very, very pleased it's that nearly finished. I think that's the first thing to say. It's been a massive slog. Um, I'm in London at the minute, so which means that I'm uh, I'm seeing my family for the first time in 14 months. That gives a sort of indication of where we've been in the world, I think, a little bit over the past year year or so. And I'm here for the Fulham game on Sunday. So um I'd be interested to see how that how that goes. But no, I mean I just want it to be finished. I'm very pleased that I won't be going to Craven Cottage um fearing that, you know, with with that sense that it's going to be the relegation playoff. I thought, you know, I think we probably all thought that a little while ago. I was at Brighton to see that catastrophic 3-0 defeat and I was convinced then that um either that we would uh, we'd be toast or um or that it would come down to this game so no it's a, it's it's been a tremendous recovery since then and uh, fair play to everybody involved with the team and the, and the club we have to say that it's it's actually almost been fun on a couple of occasions i mean Leicester was good um but really Overall, it's been a bit of a shit show, hasn't it? And I'm very, very pleased it's um, nearly finished. Yeah, I think I think that sort of sums up how most of us feel. I I was texting um, one of our one of the True Faith patrons today, Greg, and I I was just saying, you know, I'm kind of just kind of just pleased it's nearly done kind of just like feels like we've really it's been an extended season because it started later and we're gonna have um we're gonna have a a, a, a earliest this sort of later start as well next season and it's just uh I just I'm just kind of ready for it for a little bit of break and to kind of just get involved with the Euros in a way that I'm not invested like I'm not invested in Newcastle in the English national team as much as I am as Newcastle United. I don't get as upset. I don't get as frustrated. It's just more fun. So I'm kind of excited to enjoy football on that level. Um, we've uh, we've got Chris Curry says no manscaping banter tonight, please, George. Okay, strictly football. Great. That's, that's an that's an in joke, but um, about the athletic podcast. But um, but uh, but yes, no, I definitely won't. I definitely won't do that. Um, David Taylor setting the tone for the evening. We will never get our club back. Well, David, we disagree, and that's why we're here, and that's why we're going to be chatting through the um, the pledge scheme as well, and and how we've done so far. And for those of you watching who have pledged, I would love you to pop a comment on why. Uh, that would be amazing. If in fact seeing Alan Shearer's support online, um encourage you to pledge pop that down i'm sure he'd love to hear that kind of that kind of story as well and um and yeah and just yeah i'd love to hear people's reasons we've had the most amazing stories we've had stuff like um 
people saying I've pledged in my dad's memory which because this is something he totally would have got behind or had talked about and and I just think that's so lovely and you know it's just it's very very special um and just yes like so well just to say to David I mean I think um it it does feel hopeless you know I, I i share that feeling that's how it's felt a lot of the time over the past decade decade or more but we've also seen over the past few weeks since the pledge has been launched i should point out as you said at the top charlotte that fans can actually do things and fans do actually have power and fans you know when they come together and unite and there's a collective voice people can get stuff done i mean the way in which that um, you know the Super League nonsense fell apart immediately was brutal, and it was also hilarious if you're not you know one of those clubs. And that was that was people having a voice. And so you know we're we're, we're at a moment where it feels to me like we're at a moment of of change. You know, and we have to make this we have to make this count. But we can do stuff. We've shown that, and the pledge, you know, the pledge is showing that too. You are absolutely right. Now, I can see that um, Alan Shearer has joined us in the background. Alan, I think you can hear me, so I'm going to add you to the live stream now. Uh, thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited. How is everyone? Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for joining us. It's honestly, it's such a um, it's such a treat, and um, honestly, I'm a little bit excited, too excited for my own good. Um, very grateful for your time on a Friday night as well. Really, honestly, so so kind of you. Um, you. Lots of people uh, watching. Lots of people very excited to see you. I suppose I wanted to sort of kick off um, you being here, Alan, with um, with a question you you know you you tweeted in support of the pledge and i just i wanted to sort of get a sense of why that was no i'm um I, i'm i'm like everyone else i'm a fan i'm a fan of football i'm a fan of our football club um i'm not asking for fans to run football clubs and i don't think anyone should do that but I absolutely see fans having a say and having a voice in their football club because over the last 14 months, if we've realised something, we have to realise that football without fans is not what we want it to be and where it should be or what we like it to be because it's it's soulless, it's light, it's, it has no life to it. Um, so... If there was one thing to come out of of COVID over the last 14 months, and it should be that how much we all or our fans and fans all around the world mean to football. Uh, and I just hope that that is going to be recognised and that is the case. Oops, sorry, I was muted there. Yeah, I totally agree. I think you're so right. And and I think, George, you've you've sort of said it in some of your pieces and stuff, the matches that you've gone to football without fans is is just it, totally soulless. That's the absolute right word. And mm. and 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 you're right, you know, a, a lot of people have said, What you think you're gonna run the club? You think you're gonna get this money and run the club? No, no, like, but have a fans having a say in in the way that the club goes is is really important on, on matters that that you know affect them. I think is really important so so it's just it's just amazing to um to to sort of have you behind the scheme um alan i've also got warren barton in the background so i'm gonna bring him in say hello if that's okay warren um hi thank you very much for joining us no problem pleasure alan how are you my friend what's the barton center part <laughs> <laughs> it's good i'm catching up to you al I'm catching up to you. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> it's so much easier and simple. So Absolutely. much easier and simple. Of course it is, yeah. It saves you, it saves you an hour every day, you see. It used to take me two hours to get my hair like that. You know me. <laughs> I'm pleased you said that because I was just about to say that. I, 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 oh my exactly. Goodness. I bet, I bet. The flowing locks back in the day, everybody used to take ages. One of the questions we used to ask Keith Gillespie was when he when he shared with Ginola, did he take ages on his hair? And he was like, no, he just used to smoke loads. <laughs> so uh, 
so a little bit different. Um, so Warren and Alan, as ex-players, as pundits, as people who are engaged with the club, um, I guess, uh, Alan, I'll come to you first. Um, we're, we're safe, Newcastle United are safe. How do you feel that the season has gone? How, how, how do you feel about it? Um, well, we now we've come to the end of it and we are safe. It, it depends how you want to look at it. I mean, we, we are, unfortunately, we are a football club and we have an owner that wants to survive. And that is their desire just to, to survive. So we have done that. We've done it with a little bit to spare. It's been, it's been a difficult season for many reasons. Um, and it's been hard to watch at times. But come the end of it, the number of points that we have, um, how we've got there, However you want to judge it, we are, we are where we are. We just, we, we unfortunately, we're just Newcastle United who wants to avoid relegation and we've done that. And it, as I said, it's, it's, been a, it's been a tough watch at times, but we have survived. So, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it is difficult. I mean, I, I always listen to fans, I listen to pundits, I listen to the manager. I listen to everyone else and the one thing that keeps coming back is the expectation and I just think Newcastle United, we expect that the players pull on the shirt and work their ass off for Newcastle United and that's all that anyone ever wants. So, in the job that he's done in Steve Bruce, it hasn't been pretty at times but he's done, he's done the job that's been asked of him from the owner. That's just it, isn't it? The, you, you're absolutely right. It's it's a it's a case of of you know wanting to stay up and that that being it. And and I suppose from that perspective, the the season has been successful. You're right again to say it's not been pretty. Warren, Warren, what do you? Uh, what's your sort of take? I suppose it it can't really be much different, but it's been a grind. I think Jules said it, and Alan rightly said it as well. You know, watching the team, particularly. Uh, early on in the season, there was quite a bit of optimism with players coming in, uh, got a good result against West Ham. And you're thinking, you know, the boys are going to push on and be a bit aggressive in their tactics and, and obviously try and win games. And then it nullified into, you know, the Sheffield United game away from home for me was the, the turning point where you go to a team that don't look like they're going to win a game. Uh, you go into them when you've on the back of a couple of decent results and you sit back and invite them on to win the game. Uh, and when you have people saying, well, he's not done a, uh, a bad job, he's doing well, and a team that haven't won a game go and beat you um, uh, like Sheffield United did. So it's just been disappointing. It's been a grind. And I can hear it in Alan's voice. He's like, we've sort of accepted it. But we all know, and because of the club and being around it, we want more than that. I want more to see. I'm not saying it when we had our time with whether it's Kevin Keegan, Sir Bobby, we're trying to have a go. We're trying to win the, the game. And it wasn't always the way of, of, of winning the game. But we would go out there and try and be positive. Yes, we had Alan, because that try and gives you a goal start every time. And people like Shay Given and Bobby and Gary Speed. But at the end of the day, it's, it, it's a club that means so much to so many people in so many ways. And it's emulated by being on the field. When you, Like Alan said, you put that black and white shirt on. The, the least you do is try and win a game and go forward and, uh, and, and work hard for the team. We look like sometimes in the games that we're looking not to get beat. And again, whether that's a tactics, mindset, whatever it may be, that's where it's been a grind. I think we're good enough as a squad of players to be a, a West Ham. You know, look where Everton are. I don't think there's too much difference, but it's just been the way we've gone about this season. As I said, it started off reasonably well. Then we get that performance against Sheffield United. And then it's been a grind. Yes, we've had one or two injuries, but even before that, when the players was fit, it wasn't a, a style of football that's accustomed to with with Newcastle. You know, the, the, the fans want to be entertained. They want to have players to go out there and, and epitomise what they are. It's hardworking, honest, you know, people that go out and try and win a game. And, you know, the excitement of going to St James's Park hasn't been there for a long time. And although I'm the other side of the world, with America, I, can, I can, you can sense the frustration and the, and the disappointment. Um, and do we need another season? Like, it's like we're celebrating that we've we've stayed up. I mean, surely, I remember Steve Bruce saying in there, well, my brief is to stay up. I'm sure Alan and you know, maybe would or not agree, but if I was the coach, I want a bit more than staying up. I want to turn the corner. It's like when Bobby took over from Rude, 
was he just going to say we'll be mid-table? He, he had a plan, he had a vision and an idea of the club of where it should be. Yes, we had Alan and yes, we had good players around, but there was an identity and there was a, a passion about the team. I don't see that, Al. I don't know whether you're saying because you're right on the but doorstep. What, but, but when you, when you say um, uh, about the manager and about the steamer, where, where, where do you think where do you think we should finish? Where do you ex where do you think or what do you think should happen? Because I think given the circumstances, given the injuries, given COVID, given the squad we have, we are a squad that can finish anywhere in between 12th and 19th or 20th. I mean, uh, uh, do I would you say, think different to that? Yeah, I would say with the, the we've just shown in this small, small period, uh, again, when we've been under pressure, the small games, we could end up at least in the top 10. At least you've got to be, that's got to be your benchmark. Really? For Newcastle. <laughs> I would. Yeah, yeah it's I, all right. I, I get, I get, I get, I get, I get the, I get the benchmark what you want for Newcastle. But you, do you think the squad that we have is good enough to finish in the top ten? I would. I've just seen it in the last seven or eight games. I think if you give them the mindset to be aggressive and go forward, I know we've had injuries, and every club has had their injuries. Look at Liverpool, what's happened to them, but they're still able to turn the corner. And listen, they've got far, far may, maybe better individuals than we have. But when I look at what we've got and the personnel. And the, the uh, mindset that's changed, probably in the last seven or eight weeks, we can go to Anfield and get a result. We can go to certain games, Burnley, and get a result. When when we play on the front foot, when we're a bit more aggressive in our in the way we play, defend a little bit better. You, you've seen that in recent weeks. So why can't you do that the early part of the season going forward? If I can, if I can interject very, very briefly. Yeah, uh, I, please I do. Want to listen, I want to listen to these two people talk, but... The point is, it's not a club that is built or that's interested in finishing in the top 10, isn't it? I mean, you can have that view about the, the squad as it is now, but if they finish 10th, they won't push on because they never have done. You know, on the rare occasions that they have a good situation or a good season or put themselves into a healthy situation where there's something to build on, they don't do it. They just, they never have. And that's the thing. That's the thing that worries me is that, um, you know, it's not a club, it's not a cl there's nothing to buy into. You know, what, do we, what are we supposed to buy into this version of Newcastle? What are fans supposed to buy into moving forward? We've had two horrible seasons that have been affected by the pandemic, we know that, and all the rest of it. It's and it, it's like the, the club has had mitigating factors, and, and it's fine to sort of say we just have to get through this season, we just have to get through this season. But this version of Newcastle has been doing that for 14 years just getting through that's all they're interested in so i totally agree and you know warren i agree with the sentiment i would love to see us pushing on for for, for top 10 that is the absolute dream so somebody um, there's lots of comments coming in so i've lost it but it was we should be you know we, we we should be competing with the likes of everton stuff like that i totally believe that um let's talk a little bit more positively though shall we so we've had um We've had people commenting, Stephen Egan says, very tough season. Where would we have finished this season without Willock, though? What a lone signing. Um, Alan, have you been impressed with him? I mean, you must have been. Yeah, hugely impressed. And I think the manager did very well in, in getting him in. Um, I know it's taken maybe taken him a little bit of time to get in there. But when he's been into the, into the side, he's given us a huge option, something that we've... We haven't had. He's given us legs in midfield. He's given us someone who can get forward, who can break into the uh, into the box and and finish off uh, off those chances that we that we want him to do. So he's been a huge positive in Newcastle team. I mean, seven goals and some of these some of these goals that he has scored has, has been hugely important. So yeah, um, I would love to see him in the black and white shirt next season. Uh, do I do I think? He be there i really couldn't answer that there's only one guy that can answer that um and that's that's the owner is he is he going to be prepared to 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 spend enough to uh to get him in because with him doing well he's added a couple of notes onto his there uh, onto the transfer <laughs> fee and, and and onto his onto his salary as well which which he will demand or his agent will demand so that uh i would love to see him in, in our shirt next season but um i, I really don't know whether we'll uh, we'll we'll do enough to get him here 
Yeah, it's a it's a good question. And I know there's sort of little uh, snipes in the media now. Arteta saying, nope, he's staying. He's done really well there, and he's staying at Arsenal. He's got a contract with mm -hmm. Arsenal. But but the the journalists saying, well, that's that's a tactic too. They're just pushing up his price. All of this stuff. So it would be great. He's fit into the into the side so well, and we really needed right. those legs, like you say, in in midfield. Um. I'll I'll come to you both with your sort of player of the season um as well. So Warren, I'll I'll let you I'll let you start if if you have a player of the season. Is it Willick, Wilson, SM, someone else? Who who would it be? First of all, I've got to apologize as well. I must apologize to Alan to congratulate her. I know I've it on the phone now, but to get into the Hall of Fame for Newcastle is magnificent. So I must say Yeah, that I was saying yeah, you're absolutely right, Warren. I was waiting for that. Thank you. Well done. Yeah, I do, I do apologize. <laughs> I know I I know I text you back. You did, I'm you not did a serious text me. note. I mean fantastic. I, I, I was so Thank pleased you. for you. You and your you and your family and everybody else. So I get that out of the way. Um I think Almiron has done well. Um he works extremely hard. Um but you're judged on goals, and I think Wilson has got the, the 12 goals that we need. Um, if Woolock, as Alan rightly said, would have been here maybe three or four months. So I will go with Wilson up front. I know the fans have said it. He, he's, a, he's a little bit of an X factor. Um, so that's that's where I'd go with him. I think if we'd had him a bit more consistently, he's not an Alan Shearer, but he's someone that if you give him, I don't know, three chances, you're going to put one of them away or two chances, it put one of them away. So... From that point of view, I go with him. Um, trying to be positive, keep it upbeat, so I go with a striker. What do you say, Al? Don't go with a defender, surely. No, you're joking. I'm not going with a defender. Um, <laughs> no, I'm going with Callum. Um, he's, he's delivered the goals in a very difficult season. Um, and people will say, well, there's been a few penalties, but you have to stick the penalties away and you have to be uh, you have to have the balls to get up there and uh, and take it and and do what you have to do so and i know he's missed a few in a few games with the injuries but that's what he is we knew that when uh, when we signed him that's because of he, you look at the rest of his career he, are, he is going to have injuries throughout the season um but it would, i would have to say callum wilson definitely yeah, uh, he's what's, been his strength, what's his strengths? You look at him and then, you know, yes, pace, this, that, but what other things is he good at? What can he work on from you looking at him? He, stretch, he, stre he stretches teams, Warren. He, stre he does something for Newcastle that we haven't, we haven't got when he's not on the team. He, he's someone who is, is able and has the ability to, to run in behind. And he's, he's very clever. He times his run. Uh, he runs really well. And Newcastle are a different team when he's been in that in that eleven, and we haven't got anyone like him that can do that job. So, as well as he's finishing, it's his ability to run in behind. Yeah, and he won he won Player of the Season, and uh, Newcastle United gave him that very small trophy that he was <laughs> photographed with. So, uh, he he won Player of the Season. He has been excellent. Um, I think there's a real you know you talk for all the talk that we've had here about um, coming out and not not wanting it or not you know Callum Wilson wants to score goals. You can see that like he is after get notching those goals up, and it's. It's such a pleasure to kind of see that, you know, Joel Linton has gotten slightly better over the last season or so and, and seems to have got more comfortable in the team. But um, he doesn't go after the ball in the same way. He's not hungry for the goals in the same way. And we really, really needed that in the um, in the uh, in the squad. So I totally agree. I think he's been excellent. And uh, and clearly the, the, the yeah, Warren, go, go, go. So I, I just want to tell the fans a quick story about Alan, what makes Alan, in my opinion, better than anybody else. And then we've looked enough with, you know, Les Ferdinand, Peter Beersley, Tino, Janola, all these players. When Alan come over for the world record for 15 million, and obviously I've been with, involved with Alan with England uh, a little bit, but the first thing that jumped out to me is how ruthless he was in training, scoring goals. You know, I, I don't want to embarrass you too much, Albert. It's only when you sit back and you think about how we used to train and how we used to go out and play the games that other strikers you would see, even Paul Kitson, who was another good player, and Bellamy and these type of players, they, they would go in after training. But Al would always, even when he got 200 goals, 200, whatever it was, he would still say to Nobby or Lauren Rebeau or me or Griffin, whoever it was, Aaron, where are you going? Let's put some balls in. And that's, for me, Al, that always, not only your mental toughness and you as a player, uh, and as a person, 
but that what puts you a cut above the rest. And there's always some great players. I'm talking about really, really good players. But that's what made Alan. So when people think about Alan Shearer playing for England and wearing a number nine, it wasn't just that on a Saturday or a Wednesday or a Tuesday. It was a cold Monday afternoon getting behind and putting some balls in the box. I just want fans to understand what goes through someone like Alan's pedigree and mindset. You know, other players would be walking in, getting in their cars, going back. But he'd be the first one there doing these exercises in the gym at Chesley Street, drop the kids off at school. We're all being there having a cup of tea and then we go and do our training. Then afterwards, they'll be getting in their cars, doing it. And Alan would be out there with two or three of us finishing it off. So I think people have to understand what goes in. It doesn't just happen to be a Hall of Famer or a top player in the Premier League just by accident. It, and, and that's what I think misses a little bit at the moment with younger players going through. But uh, I've always wanted to tell you that, Al. Uh, so I just no, thank I you. I mean, and, thanks, thanks for it. I, mean, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I mean, I've I my, all my time at Southampton and Blackburn and Newcastle. Um, I probably had a certain way of telling everyone what I wanted to do in terms of whether I wanted you or Ginola or Keith Gillespie or or whatever. Yeah, you did. And, you, and, oh, you, you, you'd turn did, around yeah, and say, I, "Where the fucking hell are you going?" You would say, "Where the fuck are you?" <laughs> And the ball. <laughs> yeah, I get that, but I, I don't think I ever fell out with anyone because of that. I mean, I said it in training, I said it in the matches, but you know what? I was the I was the first in the bar and having a pint with everyone and having a laugh and a joke. But I just think it was my job to score goals, and I needed everyone around me to help me score goals, and that's the way I was driven. And I, when I was a fifteen-year-old kid, I wasn't the best player, and I wasn't um, one of these guys who could go past five or six people but uh, I was the best at working on the best at being on time and I perhaps had the best attitude and I think that's how I got to, to where I did so I, I appreciate you saying that thank you that's it it's hey, the you, word you used to hate pre, it used to hate pre-season tell me about pre-season <laughs> <laughs> yeah I didn't like pre-seasons no I was, I was no good at running I was at the back I was still always at the back of running but you know what Warren Get the ball, get the ball out, get the ball out. <laughs> as soon as I see that head rolling, I knew he was in trouble. Once that head started rolling, he was in trouble. <laughs> That's right. Oh my God, That's amazing. Right. Um, Alan, I know that you have very kindly given us a little bit more time than you've said, and, I, and I'm conscious it's your Friday night, so I will let you go very shortly. I will ask you one question somebody's asked, um, which I think is a decent one. Um, who would your realistic signing be this summer? Uh, if, if, if we're being realistic, we're not going hundreds of millions, obviously, on players. Um, where do we need to strengthen, probably, is the first sort of consideration? And then who would you realistically hope we could sign? Well, I think the, the standout signing has to be, it's obvious, it's staring us in the face. We have him already. He's, yeah. he's sampled a small part of, of St. James's Park already, and it's Joe Willick. Um, I mean, I, I jokingly said the other night on match of the day when Gary said, well, you're not going to get him because he's going to go back to Arsenal. And I said, well, he, he, that's not that's rubbish. He'd like to come and play for a big club. Um, <laughs> I mean, there was, there, was, there was a little bit of truth in there because I would love him to come and sample 52,000 at St. James's Park when, when it's rocking, when it's going well, when we're in, uh, getting the right result and the reception he and the team would get for one of his goals that he scored for us. So... I think it's an absolute no-brainer. Newcastle have to try and break the bank and try and get him here and for him to sample the brilliant atmosphere that our fans can, can give him. Whether we will or not, I don't know, but I bloody well hope so. Yeah, I'm with you. I think he got a taste of it on Wednesday night and you could see it on his face. Everybody was shouting, Joe Willett, we want you to stay. And he was beaming. Absolutely. It was... Uh, and that was only a couple of hundred who'd stayed behind if it was fifty-two in full, fifty-two thousand in full voice. Well, he, I, I, as you know, I worked with Wrighty most Saturday nights, Ian Wright, and um, Ian speaks to to Joe, and has been a, a little bit of a mentor to him. So I, I keep saying to him, if he ever needs or wants anything, and he, the, my number's there, and uh, I, I would love him to sample fifty-two thousand on Saturday afternoon at Newcastle when things are going well because there is no better place in the world of football than St James's Park on a Saturday afternoon when that's happening. So but 
it, it might be out of his hands, um, but I, I really hope that we break the bank to try and bring, and bring him here because he's, 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 he's been incredible for Newcastle over the last few months. Absolutely. Uh, Warren, did you want to jump in? And Alan, I will yeah. let you go after Warren speaks, I promise. I just, I just want to ask Al, what do you miss, my friend, about the game? What do you miss? Uh, I, I just, I just miss the adrenaline rush. I mean, um, I don't miss you and the lads in the dressing room. That's for sure. I just <laughs> miss the. <adrenaline. laughs> I just, I just. Yeah, where do, you, where do you get the adrenaline rush from? I mean, of scoring, of running out in it at our stadium. Um, that's, that's what you miss. And whatever you do in the years after you've retired, you can never ever get that back. Lovely. We might, well, do, that... we might, we might do live television. Might do bits, uh, but you can you never get that adrenaline rush back of running out at the ground or scoring, um, and it's an incredible buzz, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Alan, so much for joining us this evening. I'm so grateful thank and thank you. you so much for your ongoing support for the 1892 Pledge Scheme. We're very grateful to have uh, somebody like you behind the scheme. So um, all you have to do is click off and you can go and enjoy your Friday night. Thank uh, you very thank much. You. Thanks for having me. Good luck to everyone and thank you very much. Thanks so much again. Cheers, um, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was fun. That was a really fun time with Alan Shearer there. Um, thank you, Warren, for the for the memories there. We're going to make you reminisce as well with uh, with Keith a little bit later. Um, we've got loads more coming. People watching, please do stay tuned. Warren's going to stick with us. George is with us. Ian's in the wings. I can see him. He he waved at Alan. Oh no, he, he clapped Alan before. He, nobody can see him but me. But he keeps waving. It's just adorable um <laughs> thank you everybody who's watching please do write your questions in we're going to keep talking about the season we're going to keep talking about the the fan led review we're going to talk about the bloody super league and um, all of that stuff um but i will i will pause us i think and play if i can those of you who've been watching since the very beginning may know that this may not go right but i'm going to try and just remind everybody why we're here with um a little bit of an animation about the 1892 pledge scheme introducing the 1892 pledge scheme from the newcastle united supporters trust we are one of the most celebrated fan bases in football we embody the spirit of the greatest city going Newcastle upon Tyne, but you'll find black and white running throughout the entire North East and just about everywhere else in the British Isles. But we're not just the best fans in the country these days, but the best fans on the planet because we're everywhere. So what is the 1892 Pledge Scheme? Well, we are asking you, the supporters of this historic football club, to make a small monthly payment by direct debit or a little bit when you can. So fans can buy a small share of a club whenever it's next sold. Or be ready to save it, should we fall down divisions, make them as affordable enough for fans to buy outright. With our global fan base paying in a tiny contribution, we'll get there united. And we've appointed some reliable people and familiar faces to keep that money safe, acting as guardians for the cash you pay in. This is your football club. It belongs to us. And by giving something small monthly or when we can, we will raise enough to have a small stake in our club. And what happens if we fail? Then your guardians will donate all of that money to a selection of Northeast charities. So please, pledge what you can and help take Newcastle United forward. This is the 1892 Pledge Scheme. Are you with us? There we go. That is a animation that uh, expertly narrated by Emil Franchi, uh, just describing to you what the what the pledge scheme is um, and all and all of that stuff. Stephen Egan saying, "Hope everybody watching has contributed to the 1892 pledge scheme already. If you have, thank you so much. Write why. Tell us why. Tell us your tell us all your stories. And uh, and if you've if you've pledged." A one-off, consider a monthly. That's how we keep this going. We are, you know, we are, um, oh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but my phone has them. So I'll get you the numbers shortly and I can give you an update on where we are and where we hope to be. But in the wings this time, I promised some takeover chat, which I think we'll do when, when Ian joins us shortly anyway. But in the wings here, I see Keith Gillespie, um poking his head out hi Keith thanks for joining us this evening 
Hi, Charlotte. How are you? I'm good, thank you. We've got Warren Barton and George here. I don't know what you can see on your screen. I know I've got the full sort of suite here. Hi, Warren. Hi, George. How's things? Hi, Keith. How are you, my friend? All right, Keith. Good with the I'm beer, good, mate. Yeah, thanks, man. I'm just really <laughs> It's nice that lockdown look, Keith. Time. It's a lockdown yeah, look. I love it. I can't grow anything myself. I keep trying. <laughs> um, so, Keith, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we've just had um, Alan Shearer on chatting through. We've stolen quite a lot of his Friday night, and I'm going to steal some of yours now. Um, we are, of course, talking about the 1892 Pledge Scheme, a fan-led project to try and raise enough money to buy a stake as fans in Newcastle United when it is sold, because we will be sold eventually like that is just fact eventually it may not be tomorrow it may not be next year but eventually it's going to happen and we want to say when it happens um but we're also here to talk about the season and to talk about memories and to talk about happier times and that's one of the reasons it's so great to have you on keith and warren and also George, because as a as a man who has to watch every minute of every game, he's got a pretty good insight as well. So um, let's, uh, somebody has asked a question about the takeover. I do just want to say, well, the arbitration and all that, I do just want to say that we will do a little segment on that just to sort of get it out of the way. Uh, George's face is not a happy one, um, but, uh, but we will get there. We'll get there. Um, uh, Keith, uh, yes, thank you so much for joining us. Somebody's asking, Warren, excuse me if this is not a good story and you can just nod to me, but he says, tell the story of you and Rob Lee in the limo. Um, I don't know about that one. So I can't hear you. It keeps breaking up a little bit. I, I don't know. I can't, can't All really right, then that one yeah, sounds, sorry. yeah, no worries. It, you know what? You're in America. The signal's not great. We yeah, don't have to go sorry into about it. That. Sorry about um, that, Keith, no. <laughs> you, you don't even have to worry. Keith, um, we were talking before we got our sort of um, overview of the um, of, of people's feelings on the season. How do you feel that the season has gone? Are you pleased with it? We're staying up. Is that enough? I mean, how do you feel? Um, I mean, it started off really good. I mean, the first game of the season, I thought, well, there would be no chance of even flirting a relegation. But I think as the season progressed, the team, you know, it showed that there was a real lack of quality at times. I know we finished the season pretty well, which is good. And the thing about it is it's not good enough in terms of, of Newcastle that, you know, we're happy with just staying up. You know, we need to be, you know, doing what West Ham are doing. We need to sort of challenge and further up the table. Um, and it's going to be a big sort of um, transfer window coming up because, you know, there needs to be better players coming in. Uh, you know, you look at what they did last year. Callum Wilson was was a great signing. Um, hopefully, uh, there's talk that Willock might be coming. I think he'd be a great signing. But other than that, the signings that they made, I don't think it really worked. Um, you know, so it's it's disappointing. But I think the good thing is that they finished the season strongly, as as opposed to last year when they realised they were sort of safe. They finished the season really poorly. So, you know, lately the the, the performances have been a lot better. Um, because I did fear for them after they lost against Brighton, but you know, thankfully, you know, we stayed up. As I say, that's that's not good enough. You know, Warren knows as well from from playing at the club. You know what what a special club it is, and you know, just surviving is just not good enough. Yeah, you know, Kate, 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 just you, you said it well, and I said the same thing to Alan as well. You know that the last seven or eight games, why wouldn't we play like that early on in the season? I mean, you're yeah, you're there. Well, you, you're saying, why would you think they? Why would you think the team haven't played like that? You know, October, November, December time. Ex exactly. Um, you know, there's been sort of patches here and there where performance has been okay, but you know, it, they haven't really been able to to string a, you know, quite a few results together. You know, they've they've had performances here and there, as I say, but you know, I I, I don't know why performance improved. Uh, maybe. The fact that they realised they got safe, they could play with, you know, no fear then. But it sh it shouldn't really take that. Just playing with, you know, that now that you're safe, playing with no fear, you know, you should be going out and and putting in, you know, performance like they have been lately. You know, the majority of the season, and unfortunately they haven't. But for me, it, it goes down to the squad because you know I don't think the squad is strong enough, and there's 
there's too many positions where I think they're quite weak. So, you know, as I say, it's going to be a big, uh, a big window where they're going to have to improve. It's interesting though, because I was at I was at Leeds a couple of weeks ago and saw them play Tottenham, and they were absolutely superb. And you know they've had big injuries. They didn't have Calvin Phillips that day. They didn't have Rafinha that day. They both both came on. And there is a way that a club can have a way of playing, and it can be from top to bottom and all that. And it feels like at Newcastle this season and last season, we've just been bouncing between system, bouncing between formations, bouncing between personnel. And, you know, partly that comes down to the manager because it has to, but also partly it's because the, the club don't team build. They don't do team building. I mean, Jalinton is the absolute classic example of that, that he was bought for 40 million quid to replace a striker when he's not a striker and given given to a manager who didn't particularly want him and then clearly didn't know what to do with him. And that's been the way Newcastle have been for ages. I mean, Leeds... Um, you know, I've only been to one of their games, but they were so impressive and they, they represented the leads that I would want to see. You know, the leads that I think of in my head is that aggressive, running, in your face, don't give a toss about anybody else. And it's great to, you know, it's great to see Newcastle could be like that if they had a system, if they had ambition, if they knew what they were doing from top to bottom. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right in terms of leads because it doesn't matter. You know, if they're three nil up, three nil down, they don't change their philosophy. You know, they, they just want to play football, and that and as you say, that's the managers instilled that into those players what he wants them to do, and they don't they don't sway away from that, and that's why they've probably been a success this season because every every player knows exactly what the manager wants them to do. So interesting points that are coming up from quite a few people. Um, Warren, you mentioned there. Um, well, why? Why in November, December was it not like that? Why? Like why? A lot of people coming into the comments and saying Graham Jones is the reason Graham Jones wasn't there. Then, is it the case that, like, from a player's point of view, maybe Warren and Keith, if you could, if you could opine, is it the case that a, a new assistant coach could impact? the squad in such a way that would, I mean, it's not been, let's be realistic, it's not been a seismic change since like January, um, since he joined, but it has been a bit of a change and there has been a bit more positivity on the pitch. Is it the case in your experience, or maybe you don't have that experience, but could you imagine it making that much of a difference, Warren? Yeah, I think it can, a, a different voice uh, coming in. I, I go back to when me and Keith was playing and they, you know, Kevin Keegan brought Mark Lawrence in to try and straighten up the defence. That just had a ne negative effect because he wasn't, he couldn't coach, he couldn't get us together. So Kevin at that time tried to bring in a new voice to help us be a bit more uh, stronger at the back. But it, it unfortunately it didn't work, you know, because Mark couldn't put a session on. He couldn't do it there where now you've got another coach that's come in that's worked with Roberto Martinez, where we top class players, uh, and maybe a different voice and a different direction. And even for Steve Bruce to maybe step back and let him do some of the sessions, maybe could have been a bit more refreshing. But I'm ultimately, I don't know Steve that well, but I played against him for a number of years. I can't imagine him letting him rule the roost and take over. I think Steve's still one of these guys that he will stick to his foundation, he will stick to his system. Yes, there was one or two injuries, but even before that, they started, you know, sitting behind the ball, Joe Linton sitting deep and then, you know, trying to play on the counter-attack. But unfortunately, they wasn't as, as good enough in the counter-attack and defended as well. So they got called out and kept inviting pressure on. So maybe a coach, Keith, can come in and have some sort of impact. But I'd be very surprised if someone like Steve would let him take over and do it. But because as you've seen it, it's sort of died down a little bit. Then there's been one or two and then it's died down. So there's not been that you know, lift that we would have hoped to to, to have from a new coach coming in. Yeah, what, what do you think, Keith? Do you think do you think the same? Do you think it could have made that much of a difference? I think I think it probably make, can make some sort of difference. You know, I, I, I was actually thinking the same thing as as Warren when when he spoke about Mark Lawrence. You know, because it, you know it, it it didn't work then. Uh, but you know, certainly as Warren says, a new voice. Somebody for Steve Bruce to lean on, some maybe fresh ideas that that maybe he's learnt, you know, under the likes of Roberto Martinez when he's been working with the Belgian squad, you know. So 
you know, few fresh ideas is, is, is always going to help. Um, you know, it, it gives the manager other options. Uh, but as Warren says, you know, it, it, it all comes down to the manager, you know, and he's, he's, it's with, he's where the buck stops, you know, and, and if he thinks that it's bringing somebody in can help and it has helped, you know, it's 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 been a good appointment in the end. But you know, as Warren says, you know, it, it all comes down to what Steve Bruce, you know, ultimately does and thinks. Yeah, absolutely right. So, sort of on the same vein, Gallagher Shots, who is very kindly this evening, one of the fan channels that is um, hosting us, um, as well as NUFC 360 through there's the Trust, True Faith and Newcastle Fans TV. Thank you. I just want to shout you all out. It's very kind of you to use your platforms this evening to get our message far and wide. Very grateful. And uh, and yeah, just absolutely brilliant. Gallagher Shots saying, how important was the likes of Terry Mack to the players? Keegan got all the plaudits, but what was... Terry Mack like um dive in if you want to I'll let Keith go first <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean Terry Terry knows himself he, he Terry wasn't really a coach you know he never really put on a session um Terry's big strength was was his communication with the players was, was very good he was great in the dressing room he had a great you know sense of humor um and and him and kevin just sort of bounced off each other um you know, terry mag you know wasn't hired for his coaching ability he was hired for the way he can speak to players and and be the sort of go-between at times between the manager and the players and and the players loved him um, and, and terry, terry i would know that he, he, he was never comfortable and if he was having to stand there and take on take on a session that just wasn't terry but Terry was important in that, in the, you know, Terry this week, you know, he was such a great player and, and, you know, his time at Liverpool, Newcastle, you know, so when Terry did speak, you did listen and you took everything on board, but he was, he was a fantastic character and, you know, he was, he was big, a big part of, of the success that we had then under, under Kevin, you know, because as I say, the, the sort of, the chemistry that Kevin and, and, and Terry had between each other was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Terry. Terry was brilliant. You know, one he was fantastic at head tennis. Even even KK was <laughs> yeah. unbeatable at, at Maiden Castle. He was but Keith just touched on it there. Even Terry would speak to say a, a Rob Lee or a Lee Clark or Keith or or even David Ginola. Just the little things, of the information. I mean, he won the European Cup. How many times he tells the the player he was, and he was brilliant as a buffer. That you know, because sometimes Kevin was so emotional. You know, we didn't lose that many games, but when he was. He was so emotional. Terry was great to go and talk to, whether it was the captain, Peter, or Les, or Keith, whoever wanted to go and talk to Terry. He would find a way to get their point across to Kevin and say, look, the lads need this without, you know, one of us upsetting him. Um, and he wanted to be around. His knowledge of the game was fantastic. Um, a great character. Uh, again, funny to be around. And that emulated Keith, didn't it? All of us at that time. We, every time we were yeah. going to train, we would socialise together. You've seen the picture where there's, 25 of us going out on a Monday night for some Italian and then we'd go and win a game at the weekend. Then we'd be the first ones in at training. So that time, and Terry was a big part of that because he was such fun to be around and you wanted to be at the Maiden Castle. You wanted to get in early. Even though the facilities wasn't great, we would all be there early, Keith and everybody having a cup of tea, getting ready for the game, laughing and joking. And the training, it was just a joy to be around. And then you had four or five thousand fans outside in the pouring rain and the cold weather waiting for us to come out and have a game it was just emulated everything terry was a big big part of that um and made you when there's a couple of difficult times that you could go and ask him a couple of things and he had the answer and he wouldn't let anybody know he'd just tell you that he was fantastic amazing sorry oh, I, I keep muting myself and then forgetting that i've muted myself so i'm sure that's a problem everybody's had in the pandemic right um so uh lee foster this is a good question um and somebody somebody asked a funny question on twitter to alan Chew, which i couldn't bring myself to ask him about why he wore long sleeves in like the hottest country he'd ever played in and only ever wore short sleeves in Newcastle, but did the team appreciate the beauty of the kits you played in at the time, the home granddad collar and the, the away Dennis the Menace, or was it just another kit? This is a great question because I don't know if you two know how much cult kits are getting on, like money-wise and how much love they're getting online. I know Ketch, who 
who uh, writes for the Chronicle and and is a makes his own podcast. Uh, Keith, you you were on it recently. Um, he he loves old goalkeeper kits. He's got like all of Shaka's, all of Pavel's, like, it, it, and they're just the most amazing kind of arty pieces. Did you realise at the time that they'd be iconic, or did you just think, great, here's my strip. I'm going to play football today. No, I, th- I, I never think. It's okay. No, on. I mean you, you, you don't really then, but I think I think now when you look back and you know any kit that I've ever played in, when I look back and I sort of see it now, you know the granddad collar is the one for me. It's the you know you speak to most Newcastle fans and, and they look back and they go, that was their favourite kit. And maybe maybe it's because we we sort of had a team that was that was doing something on the pitch as well. That might have something to do with it. But for me, that the granddad collar was was you know. One of my personal favourites. Um, as, as I'm about you, Warren. Well, Keith, you always wore it in a size XXL, didn't you? Like just <laughs> billowing <laughs> off. You. I had one I size. Had one size. It, it, there wasn't a choice. <laughs> they didn't have any choice. Uh, it, well, exactly. I, I, yeah. I was a little bit. I was a little bit leaner than than the rest. I was wasn't built like the rest of the boys, <laughs> so everything looked big on me back then. Yeah, but you can run, my friend. You can run. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think, you know, them, them times, I remember, you know, uh, at the club shop at 12 o'clock at night, 5,000 people waiting to get a granddad collar shirt. Uh, I think people know I like my my fashion, my my clothes and things like that. So I remember the, the denim one as well. The neck one was a good one. We've had some shockers. Well, that gr- remember that one, Keith? The green and orange yeah. away shirt. That I mean, that was awful as well but yeah, that, we've had some good ones you know we had to, and maybe the newcastle brown owl being on there that was a big you know with the city would go and have the player of the month awards and stuff like that and um so that was a big big part of it so yeah the the granddad color was i think as again it emulated everything that the city was, was vibrant, it was cool it was different it was edgy um and so was a team you know like you you had janola on one side keith on the other pedro les it was it was phenomenal you know the players that we had and um that involved everything in, in the city as well with the the kit uh, and people being around. You know, ten thousand people waiting for season tickets to to get involved. Um, and you know, wherever we played home or away, we didn't matter. We were going to try and win the game. So uh, we had a great, great time. It was a wonderful time. I think keep you know you can maybe touch on it, but for us as young men playing in that time was was a special time. We have for, I don't know ten years, but you know we we go back and we start reminiscing and, and laughing about it because it was just. A great, great time to be involved with Newcastle in the area and the football club. Yeah, it, it was just the, the most unbelievable period. Um, yeah, I, I think I remember at the start of the season, you know, Kevin Keegan was probably the only one that thought that we could win the league. But after about four or five games, you know, we had everyone believe in that. And then I know we we obviously did in the end, but you know, we put up a we put up a hell of a fight to to, to, to try and get there, but. As Warren says, you know, it was just an incredible time. And, and Kevin was great as well because, you know, his, his relationship with the supporters was so important and he wanted the players to have that as well. Hence, you know, having open training grounds with thousands down watching. Um, and it just brought everybody together. And I, I think Newcastle is just a city where if if the football team's doing well, everyone's doing well. and And, and that's the way it was for us at that time. Keith, I Keith told- Warren, you. Sorry, Charlotte. I was just going to say, no, please. You, you, you showed us what the club can be. You showed us what the city can be. You played football that we've never seen before, and that you know we've never seen again. And you gave us something so incredibly valuable and beautiful and vibrant and dynamic and life affirming. It was, it was perfect. I mean, I, I'm saying it's perfect, and we know it didn't have the perfect ending. But you gave us memories that will last for an absolute lifetime, and um, we love you for it, and we treasure you for it. And um, you know, I look at Man City playing now, and uh, you know they they play absolutely wonderful football. But you gave us, you gave that to us a very, very long time ago, and you know you showed us, you showed us what the club could be, and uh, we'll always be eternally grateful for, for that. Yeah, I think I also George, just a touch, just oh, everybody. Just to right. touch on it, I think people would say as well, we knew that as well. We we knew the response that we had on a Sunday or a Monday, that if we won the game, and we sort of thrived on that, Keith, didn't we? But that was the adrenaline yeah. and the pump of going, that if we do well, we know this city's going to be fine. 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And we we embraced that. Yeah, it was it was pressure, wasn't it, Keith? It was a lot of it. But we sort yeah. of like looked around and like I said, me and Keith, it was easy for me. I just give the ball to Keith space and he like he did against Barcelona, just destroy people. And that's how we played. That's how and we we thrived off of that going around the street saying, You better do well this week, Martin, you better do well this week, Gillespie. We sort of got we wanted more of that and we thrived and we bounced off of each other with it as well. And it was it it was part of being successful. Yeah, I, I think in terms of the, the squad that we had, we had such a good squad and you looked around the dressing room, you thought, yeah, most weekends you're like, yeah, we didn't get a result here. And I mean, you look at that season where we did come so close and it's one thing I always say, I mean, you know, they take one of our lives, but for me, it did that year because, you know, we were, you know, the best team in the country. We were box office, everyone wanted to watch us. And unfortunately, we didn't go over the line. And, and Ian, you know, another thing I always sort of say is, you know, people sort of say, who came second in the league two two years ago, three years ago? Nobody can remember it, but they'll always remember that we passed sight, you know, because of the way that we played football and with the way we became everyone's second favourite team. And, you know, as, as Warren says, it was just a joy, you know, to be in and around the city when, you know, when things were going well for, for, for everyone on the pitch. Absolutely. And actually, that kind of um, ties into what my next question was. Um, just to say that football 1997, you keep doing something like a stick. I've never seen it before, but I'm very wary of clicking on it in case it's some kind of virus. I realize I sound like I'm 100 years old. I don't understand. But he's saying he's enjoying it. So thank you. Um, separate to that, I wanted to kind of touch on, you kind of have mentioned Barcelona and and uh, Sam on, from Newcastle Fans TV says so Keith's performance against Barcelona remains one of the greatest in Newcastle history. Um, you both played against Barcelona, and and I just and, and so I I can't help but think that that means you know you have a real sense of how good this club could be because you were there playing top flight football in Europe. Um, does it frustrate you that pundits sort of? almost well in my opinion kind of talk down to Newcastle fans does it do, do, do you do you have a sense of why you know that it's very frustrating that these um pundits sort of say that we need to rein it in a little bit when you've been there and you know what it could be Warren yeah it's frustrating I think you know that night in particular Keith it wasn't just the fact that we were playing Champions League for the first time it was playing against Barcelona and then when we walked in St James's Park and the the advertisement had all been changed the stars of the Champions League the music as well and you're playing with Valdo you know Luis Enrique Figo these type of players and you know Kenny Dalglish has said with particularly with Keith with his pace um that we they do like to push forward Louis Vega was the coach if there's some space in behind I don't know what you had for breakfast Keith that day but you was on fire um you know we talk about Tino and how <laughs> How great he was! Uh, but in my opinion, Shane makes a good days, but uh, Keith was was a match winner for me. He was he was you know time after time taking him on. So yeah, it is frustrating because you know the team have got back there with Sir Bobby Robson. They played in the you know, Santa and got a draw there. They've played in Champions League and had great results. Um, but we know because of, we've been involved in a club what it can be. These pundits that you know live wherever they live, they don't really know it for a day and go back. They don't understand the connection that the, the fans and the club is in, in the city. And, you know, the, when you go into Newcastle, the first thing you see is St. James's Park. And, you know, play for Man United, arguably one of the biggest clubs in the world. But, you know, in Manchester, you've got City fans, you've got other fans around. Newcastle, you, you don't have a choice, and, and rightly so. And, you know, it's frustrating that we've been there. It was, a, it was just a special night walking into the stadium and, and getting ready. And as I said, when we had the likes of Tino and Keith, um, you know, they was on a totally different level. Um, we made it a little bit over at the end, but we'd done enough in the first hour to, to win the game. So it was it was a special time, you know, and it was a, a special game. And not only playing in the Champions League, but you're playing against Barcelona. Um, and I think that adds to the, the tension and the excitement of the game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess Keith, similar sort of memories for you. Just the most sort of one of the most special moments of your career. It would be for me. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, I think Keith has frozen. 
<laughs> oh no, he's there. He's back. He's back. I apologize. I was for a second. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're there. I, I you're was there. for a Sorry. second. Um, I, I, I don't do breakfast. You, you should know me by now. I'm, I'm, I was the fussiest, fussiest eater ever. You've, yeah, you forgot that. But yeah, I mean, it was just, I think it was just one of them nights. And I think um, in terms of like on the right hand side, myself and you, we had, we had a great understanding. I, I knew that when you got the ball, didn't want to accomplish for me straight away. Just kept feeding me, feeding me, feeding me. We're in and out slightly with you, Keith. Is that the same for you guys? It's been like yeah. But I know Keith, I know Keith well, I know exactly what he's saying. We know, we know, we know each <laughs> you other can so just well. Piece it together. I, I, know he, I know he was frozen, but it, it was such an easy thing to say. I knew just to give him the ball. I was never going to catch him up, and he was just going to, you know, put the ball in the box, and, and and the rest was history. But even then, when his camera froze, I could still understand what he was saying. That's how well we got on. <laughs> You go. You you're a little bit back with us, Keith. Apologies. It 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 can be. It well. It's it's you know. It happens. It happens. Um, David Greenwell there saying Keith Gillespie crossed to us. I don't think we realised at the time what quality we were watching. Somebody else wanted to ask, and I apologise to you, the person that asked the question. I cannot find your comment, but uh, they wanted to know what it was like to play with Tino. Um, uh, so um, Warren. Yeah, they said again. I can't find the comment, and I do apologise. But they said I heard. I think it must have been interesting, or that must have been fun. What was it like to play with Tino Aspria? It was all of all of the above. You know, he was a, first of all a, a fantastic player. Um, you know, I think Tino doesn't get maybe the credit um, how individual the the balance the skill. Don't play him away from home because he's a liability. As soon as the, the shirt started coming out and the socks, don't ever play him away from home, but play him at home. He, he was such a joy to be around. His, his limitation of his language was was limited, but we all knew what he was. And Keith, in particular, and Alan, had a great relationship with Tino. Them two really clicked with Tino. It made it easy uh, for him to be around. But just a, a wonderful player. I mean, it, two people you should watch on Instagram. Laurent Rubert is either smoking cigars or eating or drinking, and or Tino is either at a pool party or selling condoms. So you know, there's <laughs> people. If you're going to follow anyone on Instagram, it's them too. Um, but Tino was brilliant, a great personality, a wonderful player, and I know I know Keith got on really really well. You know, again, the language barrier was there, but they see they really really clicked, and and with Big Al as well. So that was a real three unusual players or. A great, but they all really got on really, really well with her. Yeah, it's it's you know actually still rings me now. He uh he FaceTimed me a few weeks ago. Um I I I never answered. Sometimes I don't answer because I just honestly you can't understand a word he says even still. But he just it just gives me a it just gives me abuse anyway. But when I don't answer, he leaves me those voice voice notes and all every other word is a, is a swear word calling me this, that, and the other. But um, yeah, I, I I did have a, a great relationship with him, and as I say, I still do now. Uh, but you know, he was uh, he was a one-off. You know, you know, there's times where he could be infuriating to play with, and then other times, you know, he was just sensational, like the, the like the Barcelona game. You know, it's it's like sometimes you know you just didn't know what he was going to do next, and you got the feeling he didn't even know what he was going to do next. But you know. He was a great character, you know. He, he he just came into the club and just fitted in straight away. Um, had this crazy sense of humor, crazy, crazy dress sense. Remember his uh, Disney, uh, his Disney, uh, what I call it, shirt that he would have wore to, to the games with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and all, you know, to to match days, you know, and uh, everyone just took the mick out of him and he just laughed it off, but. You know, an incredible player, and you know that that night against Barcelona, the the hat trick he got will will just go you know down in, in in memory for a long, long time. Amazing! Somebody uh, is saying, "All right, Keith and Warren, Nick Emerson here, Tino's ex interpreter." <laughs> um, great to remember the Tino stories. I can't verify that, but weird lie, if it was a lie. So I'm going to go with that's probably quite true. Um, awesome. Hi, Keith. Uh, hi, Nick. Not Keith. I was just reading Keith's name off the screen. Um, 
I think tell George. Nick, tell that... Nick when we should get our money back because if he was Tino's interpreter for two <laughs> yeah. years, t- Tino knew four words of English. <laughs> so wherever Nick is, he should give money back to Newcastle because he's been <laughs> Nick. He's been Nick in a living. He knew four language, uh, four words in, in two years. <laughs> he just taught him. He just taught him how to abuse Keith Gillespie, and that's like job done. That's yeah. all he needed to do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I dread to think. I dread to think what those four words were as well. But anyway, well, you, George, yeah. you got a rough idea. You got a rough idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have. Um, I have Mark watching, who I think probably feels a bit sorry for George not getting much of a word in Edgeways. Although you look like you're having a nice evening, George. Um, what's your standout memory of that golden period, sort of ninety two to two thousand and three? That sort of ten year period, George. What's your your standout memory? No, I feel like a fraud being in this company, but um, but uh, it's just so incredible to to listen to everyone. It's just beautiful. I could listen to this uh, listen to this forever. Um, my um, my memories are much less interesting than theirs. But I mean, ninety two, ninety three was my is my kind of go to season because I'd come back from college college and I went to every home game and I was in the stand and it was just that magical rebirth of the club. And then being there for that kind of golden decade, first as a fan and then. Um, you know, being around Maiden Castle as a young reporter was just incredible. Um, and, and you know, being part of that as a writer, the first job I had, making contact, getting to know people. Uh, you know, the title, the, the title season, I'll still call it that. You know, it just has to be the, you know, has to be the standout. It's the kind of football that that I'll always think Newcastle should play because I saw them do it. And you know, I love it. I mean, and as a you know, Bobby Robson was very important to me um, as a as a kind of fellow as a, and as a journalist, and and um, you know, uh, for you know, kind of obvious obvious reasons. But um, yeah, that's that season is just you know, it's just astonishing. Warren George, very politely who, with his hand up. Go ahead, who, George. Who was good to interview and who was bad to interview in that time? And don't hold back. <laughs> Oh, I've got a few stories. I've got a few stories. I'm not sure if I can. I'm not sure if I can name and shame. I mean, Keegan was obviously incredible because you would just go down, and he would go, mm, "Okay, whatever. Can I have five minutes?" And then he would give give you this beautiful, you know, art would come out of his mouth and you know, enthusiasm and just sort of just gorgeous stuff. And Bobby was a, uh, you know, in the same way. I wrote Bobby's column for the Times, and it was so easy because he would just he would just have this like turn of phrase. And you could use two or three of those little moments and turn it into something straight straight away. I mean, people like David Batty were just never interested. You know, it was like, can I, can I, can I, can I have a word? No, nah, you're all right. You're all right. Yeah. That'll be it. And we, however long he was there for that, he just wasn't bothered. But you couldn't. I mean, he's not bothered now, is he? I'm, I, I don't know if any of either of you two have ever heard from kind of that <laughs> since then. He just wasn't bothered, though, was he? Yeah, Keith, do you remember off. when it, we're, we're, we're be training, we? we'll be finishing off training, before we even get off the field, Bats would be in his car and he changed it to yeah. a diesel because it was cheaper for him to go uh, yeah. back to Weatherby. He'd have his fingers out the car going, fuck <laughs> off, and driving out the training ground and we're still <laughs> in there. So he would shower and gone before with his fingers with his uh, Rover 400 diesel going, fuck off, and driving <laughs> driving down the road. But on a Saturday, he was able to be a player. He was phenomenal. Exactly for somebody who was such a great player, his love for football was just, <laughs> you know, minimal. Um, you know, and it, it was just like a job to him. You know, for for us, you know, it's like a, it, you know, being a footballer is like a hobby. You're getting paid to do, it. but it was like a job for him. We've got to go in, train here, right? I'll do the minimum I can. But as you say, on a Saturday, he was absolutely, you know, sincere. So he, I didn't actually realize how good a player he was until, until he came to the club. And everybody thought he was just this little rat who just tackled that. But on the ball, left foot, right foot, ping a ball, like, no problem at all. But, you know, he was a, he was a great guy. He, he was a great guy to have about the dressing room because he, he had a good sense of humour as well. He was a funny, funny man. Yeah. The, the, the truth, though, Warren, and it's not, it's not, I'm not just saying this, but... You were you were you were a great team, but you're also great lads, and so and you had that incredible bond. You were good characters, um, you know that's why it was a sort of special team. And so you were a 
you, know, you were a thrill to deal with because you were all you were all good people and good lads and you know there was that positivity about the place for most of the time and so um so it was easy to you know it was easy to talk to you and then when things weren't going so well you were very you were all very honest so um so you know a pleasure a pleasure to deal with no no prima donnas but i just i just tell you a quick story there when we first signed keith was already there with like steve howie and lee clark and the four of us had just signed and we was at the gosford park and the first training session so it must have been a ritual the first friday keith it might have been where as soon as we finished training it was all out with the boys we was going to go and have some some food and and everybody's there like even mike hooper the old goalkeeper we was there and that really broke the ice because you know david had come in Shaka Shaka was a fella, and i knew les as well it was the players that was there beforehand had said you know you're not going away the weekend friday is the first friday after the pre-season we all go into those and then the rest is history i can't remember too much about it but we'd, we'd all be there t together but that was the, the players that was already there like keith like uh, as i said kitson was there and um Scott Sellers and bears and rob would make sure the new players would come in and you'd think maybe david would fly back off to parrot but that we were told no friday we're all going out together and that stood us in good stead it wasn't kevin mm -hmm. it wasn't terry mack it was players that was already there watto um robbie elliott We'd all be there together. And that was the first really thing about, OK, we're in it together. And we did it when Tina came and it was something that they all did it. So as a player that was there beforehand, it wasn't like the new, that new beginning. It was there beforehand, Keith, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the same thing happened when I joined the club. Um, and it, it, it is a, you know, it is, it is like an icebreaker when you're out and you just get to know people a little bit better over a couple of drinks and, you know, that bonding and, and, you know that was something that we we had the abundance you know that team you know the the bonding that we had in terms of you know how often did we go out you know we used to arrange something maybe once every three weeks you know and it was one of them everybody went there was no excuses the only people who didn't go was was uh kevin terry and, and arthur cox and you had Derek Fazakerty there, Chris McManamy, you had John Carver, you had the physios and all the players. And, and you know, it was great just to have everybody together, you know, and just bonding in the, in the right way, you know, and that things were things were going well on the pitch, you know, so we continued that most of the season. Um, and, and then it sort of got to about March time and, and, and Kevin didn't really like us doing it then. And then results went downhill, so that's that's my reason and why we lost the league. Yeah, but you used to still go out. <laughs> <It's a punishment>. <laughs> 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 I, I I was I was still a, a lot younger than the rest of you, so. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, um, Keith. I'm gonna I will let you go very shortly. Um, we I have taken more of your time than I said I would. Honestly, I'm just sitting here. I'm, I'm barely doing any hosting. I'm just loving the stories. It's amazing. Those of you who are watching, I'm I'm checking on my phone. We've had loads of pledges come in during this uh, during this um, live stream. So thank you so much. Do check out 1892pledge.co.uk and have a look at what we're doing. We are trying to raise money. It's a long term scheme. We uh, we you know we're really excited about it. It's an ambitious, exciting happy project to eventually hopefully for fans to have a stake in Newcastle United when eventually that happens um the, the cases that we're sold eventually it has to happen right um we're optimistic about that um okay one question for Keith and Warren before I let Keith go I'm going to play a little video and then I'm going to bring in Ian who's dressed in something I'm sure you'll love Warren um uh, let me have a look somebody said which I think is an interesting question where i find it but yeah here it is martin Lettin says where would our 1996 team finish in this season's premier league it's interesting because it's such a different oh george is saying first 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 it's interesting because the style of play is so different to how it was in the current premier league to how football was played in 1996 having said that i think such an attacking minded sort of forward driving team would do quite well. Warren, what do you think? We could do a bit of, you know, we could pass the ball around, you know, you had that, and then obviously we had that pace and energy of Les and, and Keith. So yeah, I think we'd be challenging. There's no there's no doubt. Um 
I think you, you look at the qualities, like you said, with David Batty coming in, Tino coming in. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be positive and say that we'd win it. Uh, not on a canter, but we would win it. <laughs> All right. Love that. Uh, uh, Keith, what do you think? Agree? Oh, of course. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's... <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult now because we knew we knew what we were doing every week. We were four four two, and that was it. There was no change to our system whatsoever. Whereas I think you look at most Premier League teams nowadays. You know, to, do any of them play four four two? Do any of them sort of play with wingers? You know, there's there's none of this sort of you know big man in the middle like we had Les and Allen. You know, crossing into getting the ball wide, getting crosses in the middle. You know, it, it's it's sort of just all gone that you know I, I, I don't even know if i'd be playing in this day and age it's because as i say no no teams play with wingers which you know is quite frustrating because i think you know i know i was a winger but i think wingers are are, are players that that get the fans off on the edge of their seat because they know exactly what there is in their mind that they want to run at people and and get crosses into the middle uh but yeah certainly we could we could mix it with anyone uh, there's, there's no question about that um, so yeah, I'm in agreement with Warren. Keith, you fancy your chances against Luke Shaw, wouldn't you? You fancy your chances against him? He's <laughs> the best left back. I'm sure you fancy your chances against him. I'd have a job getting round him at times. That's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> David Greenwell, who's watching, says we'd be second to Man City. We'd never win anything. <laughs> no, David, we'd win. All right. Uh, thank you, Keith, so much. Um, as ever, just just click out and enjoy your evening and enjoy your weekend. Thanks so much for joining us and for supporting the 1892 Pledge Scheme. No We're so grateful. Um, Cheers, Warren. Cheers, George. Good luck, Keith. Good luck, my friend. Cheers, luck. mate. See you soon. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay. Thank Thanks so much, Bye -bye. Keith. Take care. Cheers. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Oh, excellent. Gosh, I can't believe we're already an hour and 20 minutes in. I feel like it's been like 10 minutes of just listening to all these fantastic stories, um, all in support of the 1892 Pledge Scheme. I'm going to play you a little message from Thomas uh, Concannon, who is one of... Uh, the board members of the Newcastle United Supporters Trust. And then we'll bring in Ian and uh, and we'll chat more about the football team, more about the pledge, and hopefully a little bit about, you know, let's. this is a real chance to dig into the top six and the Super League and uh, slag all them off. So here's Thomas with a little message uh, from outside the ground. So last night I was one of the lucky 10,000 who got a ticket for the Newcastle United against Sheffield United game. Um, one 0 win. Football wasn't great, but it was it was sensational to be back in the ground. Um, it really was. It was great seeing my mates again. Um, it was just great seeing the the stadium um, in all its glory. And um, it, yeah, it was it was incredible to be back. And it just got us thinking about about the pledge scheme and how important it is for the for the fans to have a say in their football club going forward. We've seen how important fans are after over the last last few weeks with the European Super League and everything else that's gone on. Um, it's important that we have a say and that's what the pledge scheme is all about. Hopefully we'll have new owners in the future that will, will recognise the asset that they have in our support and, and we want to go on that journey with them. That's what the pledge scheme is all about at the end of the day. We want to be in a position where we can have a have, have true influence on the football club going forward. Um, whatever league that we're in um, and hope, but hopefully that's the Premier League and, and we're pushing on for for bigger and better things with, with brand new owners who, who really care about the fans and, and by using the pledge scheme you know we've raised a hell of a lot of money in the last since it launched in April um, a hell of a lot of money th thanks to the people that have pledged over 5,000 people that have put some money into this it's incredible it's an incredible amount of people for, for it just starting and that really excites us as, as the trust board um, and it's just something we want to continue hopefully with your support going forward um, yeah and Hopefully, it's, it's not long before we're back in St James's Park, all of us together, 52,000, supporting a team and, and a club that is striving for, for, for greater and better things than, than what it currently does right now. But um, thank you for everyone's support and, and hopefully, you know, if there's any questions going forward, just ask us and hopefully we can, we can answer them and, and we, can, we can push the pledge on and, and just get back to better things. So, yeah, thank you. Oh, there we are. I'm back. I'm back. Uh, that was Thomas Concannon there from the um, Newcastle United Supporters Trust Board outside the ground. Full disclosure, I did ask Thomas to do one from inside the ground when he was there on Wednesday night, but he did not. So he went back the next day in the rain to do that video. So we're very grateful. We're very grateful. 
Um, <laughs> you'll see now, Warren, that Ian's joined us with your absolute favourite <laughs> Newcastle United shirt. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, that is a blast from the past. <laughs> Ian, you're muted, my friend, so let me unmute you. There you go. Oh, I can't. You have to. You have to. You've muted yourself. Wally can't say anything. It looks, I do better, apologize. It, looks better, it looks better on him than it did on us. <laughs> but as, soon, as soon as Warren mentioned it, I knew I had it in the bottom of a drawer and it hasn't been seen, hasn't seen the light of day for about 50 or 20 years or something, you know, but I just had to get it out, you know, because um, a, a lady friend of mine bought it for me. I think it was, I would really love it and I bloody hate it. <laughs> there's, there's nothing muted about that shirt, is there? Nothing. nothing. <laughs> no. No, we didn't that win is, much in it, like, but uh. <laughs> that is incredible. Um, so for those of you who just watched there, that was Thomas talking about the pledge scheme, thanking everybody for their support so far. Thank you, everybody, for your support this evening. We've had you know donations coming in, it's absolutely fantastic to see. Just um, for reference, we are on over, I think, over 85,000 pounds now in um, in just under. Uh, just over a month. Uh, is that right? Yes, it is. Um, which is absolutely fantastic. We're bringing in £23,000 per month on regular donations, which is uh, just unbelievably great to start with. Obviously, we want to build this. Obviously, we want uh, this to keep on snowballing. If you're looking at Hearts in the in the uh, Scottish uh, League and, and you're looking at other clubs that have done this globally, we have a real opportunity here to make a difference and get involved in our club in a meaningful way. And unfortunately, in this world, meaningful means money. Um, in in June, just for reference, in June uh, 2022, we should have um, uh, £360,000. I think I may have frozen. So we can still hear you. We can still hear you. Oh, you can still hear me. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, my camera's gone off. I might have to drop off. Um, but um, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about um, Newcastle memories? And I'm just going to try and fix my computer. <laughs> well, well, I, I can talk about Newcastle memories from the perspective of somebody that was probably you know in the seats or the terraces. And some of the incredible places that I've been watching Newcastle over the years, and, and you know Keith Gillespie uh, there. You know, I mean, I'd say in James's Park and the Gallagher at the end of the night, we beat Barcelona three two. You know, I mean, unbelievable. And and that was by the way before the ground was expanded to fifty two and a half thousand. It, you know, it was only still at the thirty six thousand ground. But what an atmosphere that night! I mean, unbelievably good. You know, and. Um, Joe Willick was saying last night he thought ten thousand fans made a lot of noise at St James's Park on on uh, on, on Wednesday night. So um, you know, I, I really would love to have him here next season and you know get, to give the fans some excitement to get the place rocking again because we haven't had that for quite some time. You know, I mean, Newcastle fans love it when we dig in and you know we get a we get a result against. You know, the, all the odds, you know, the sort of the 4-4 four, four at home against Arsenal, like those sort of results are brilliant, you know. But, you know, or when you get a bad refereeing decision against you and you, and you dig in and, 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 and you win it, win, win a home game, you know, like, like against Southampton, for instance, you know, you know, with, with down, down to 10 men, you know. And so, you know, really fantastic, uh, those, those sort of things. But, you know, we want, we want to have an opportunity to actually enjoy some really good stuff as well, you know. By the way, have I got your permission, Warren, to take this off now? As long as you've got a tip shot on underneath, hey, that's the idea. Yeah, it depends, right. what, you're, depends yeah. what you're wearing underneath. Didn't it, didn't it sound brilliant, yeah. though? Didn't it sound brilliant? Didn't it sound brilliant having people back in the stadium, though, the other night? And it, it was just 10,000, but even through the TV, ugh, it just sounded great. You know, none of that fake, fake noise nonsense. Real human beings making a great noise. And it's you know I'm I'm not sort of purposely bringing it back to the to the pledge and the trust except to say that it's that reminder that this is what it's all about it's about people and that without people football doesn't work in the same way you know it just does not resonate in the same way you don't have the same emotional connection to it it's not representative representative of you in the same way and you know this is what we're trying to say with the pledge that it's about reminding us as much as anybody else that we should have a voice in this game 
that doesn't exist without us, that shouldn't exist without us in the same way. It was just so and great to hear that and voice again. And we've and we've got a real opportunity, George, now because you know, as as Charlotte was talking about earlier, you know, the government have now probably in a knee jerk response to the um, Super League stuff. They've, they've, they've agreed to go ahead with a fan-led review of football governance. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity. And what, what the pledge scheme now does is it actually sets Newcastle fans up within a Premier League context to actually take advantage of that. And I really don't think that people can um, you know, overstate that. It, it is a fantastic opportunity now for Newcastle fans to be together through the supporters' trust through the pledge scheme, to actually have the bedrock to move that forward. And also, by the way, because of what, what's being done through the trust, the you know, the collective working together um, to actually influence what the government are doing. Because the one thing I'll say um, about the fan-led review, they, they've actually appointed Tracy Crouch, who's a Conservative MP, to, 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 to lead the review, but she is actually a football fan and understands what it's, what it's all about. Charlotte, you'd be pleased to say I've changed. <laughs> wow, a costume change. How long have I been gone? Oh, my God. Sorry, everybody. My computer just totally stopped working and um, wouldn't, yeah, just, just boot me out. So I do apologise, everybody, uh, for that. And I don't know what you've been talking about for the last couple of minutes, but I do we're see We're just talking about the fact that I'm normally the, the, the back end of a pantomime donkey, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I'd just, like to, uh, I'd just touch on as well, because obviously, like George was saying, with a pledge, and this is something that's been done on you know, for two years, three years, planning with people getting it together. And then because we see the, the Super League come on with the fans, and I said it to Terry Henry on social I said, now you know how we feel. Now you know that how their football club, whether it's Man United, Man City, Liverpool, how it's been run. And it, it's no coincidence that our scheme has been going a number of months and weeks and, you know, getting up to nearly 85,000 and, you know, monthly money coming in that's going to obviously give hope and advice. You've seen now with, with Tottenham, they've got a, a supporter on the board who they believe in. And like we've always said, we don't want to run the club. You know, we, we just want to have a voice. And particularly a club like Newcastle United should have a voice on the board to say, what do the fans expect? What do they like when they travel? I mean, look what the ownership's done at Man City to pay for the travel to go to the champion. I know when you've got billions and billions and billions of pounds, it can be easier. But it's the small things that make so much for the fans. It's like make sure the stadium is in a good set. Like Ian, I know you was at the game on Wednesday. Yeah. Not not to have a, uh, a concession stand open that you can get a drink or they they're the small things that mean so much for the fans to give you that excitement. You, you heard on the report there after the interview you could see him he was beaming he was smiling that he'd be to a game at St James's Park so you know the, the club have to understand that and support and if anything has come out of this pandemic like Alan rightly said at the beginning the fans are the heart and soul of the game regardless of each club of the football game that we play and that's that goes for me from start to finish you know without them whether it's Newcastle or down at Southampton you don't have fans you don't have the atmosphere you don't have a football club I mean, I mean, you know, the the thing that struck me about being in the Gallagher end the other night, and you know, and uh, uh, but there were there were no, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, concessions open, so you couldn't buy a cup of tea. I mean, everybody knew that there would be no alcohol available, and the bars would be shut, but you couldn't buy a cup of tea. And of course, it was a six o'clock kickoff, and therefore, for anybody coming in to the match straight from work, you know, they couldn't even buy a pie, you know, or something to eat, you know, and 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 look. I know that Mike Ashley is a businessman, and I know that with only 20% of the fans there, that it would be unlikely that the concessions would break even on a night like that. But but the thing is, it's also about providing the service for, for the fans who keep the club going. And there was no question of that the other night. I mean, it might have took a couple of extra stewards to to make sure that queues were you know socially distanced and all the rest of it. But there was loads of room. It was quite obvious there was loads of room. But you couldn't even get a cup of tea. And I, I just think that was petty myself personally. And you, you miss a chance again as a football club. You miss the chance to say, we've heard what's been going on. But yet again, there's still no rapport with the fans. There's no rapport. To say, you know, if you had a person board, like, OK, we're going to get 10,000 fans coming. You know, make sure you, uh, you know, there is some food there. There is something there. for the You miss that golden opportunity to give a good will back. Just to say yeah. thank you for paying your money, for turning up, buying a shirt, 
you can't even understand that you may lose a hundred pounds because the time you pay the staff and you know get out there you can't foresee that that goodwill gesture that, that you can do that and that, that's what sickens me that they don't see that they don't understand that you can't just do that for someone you know in this what we've gone through you can't do something because it's not about money just about giving something back to help in some out. it's ridiculous and it's all it's also topical to point out that the sunday times is it the sunday times or just the times rich list came out uh, today and Mike Ashley for all that he's very sad that the 350 million that he's or 305 or, or you know whatever it is um hasn't been put in his pocket read the takeover and George you may have escaped a lot of takeover questions tonight because it's been a lot of positivity on the um on the chat and on the comments so it doesn't look like we have to go too far into it um you, you know Mike Ashley Mike Ashley's fortune increased in the last year by something like 700 million is that is that right ian is is now like 2.7 billionaire you know if he loses 100 quid or something because he's he's letting people serve cups of tea it's pocket change it really is it's 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 for me so much about and i get made fun of because i say low hanging fruit all the time because i love that phrase but it is low hanging fruit it's if you think about the optics of it it would be such an easy win to be like oh we've put this on because it's the first game back and it cost the club you know i mean may maybe i'm being very naive about the mechanics and financials of a club but i i don't think a man who has been enriched by 700 million quid in the last year or so um c can cannot afford to do that um Maybe I'm wrong. Is that well, right, James? Well, Rose? I, mean, Go I, mean, on. I mean, I just, I, I, I just think that you know that you know somebody's putting the comments. You know why we're complaining about a cup of tea? It, it wasn't about a cup of tea. It was about, it was about you know the the, the way in which the club treats the fans generally, and it was symptomatic of that. End of story. And yeah. and, and and all I was doing, you were doing, was using that as an analogy to you know. So um, you know, so fr from from that perspective. What I think it showed yet again that even after a full season, when we haven't had fans in the ground, there was very little consideration given to what would the fans require when they actually got into the ground. You know, and 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 and, and, and therefore it's not the fact the fact the fans are an afterthought; they're not even a thought. Mm. Yeah, and yeah, I Joe, think I'll, that's... I'll, ask, I'll ask Jules. Jules, did you get a cup of tea in the where the press officers? Did you get a cup of tea? Uh, no, they. I mean, they can't do. I wasn't there because I'm in London uh, this week. But oh. I'm going to Fulham. I'm going to Fulham on um, on Sunday. But they can't. I mean, certainly in the press areas, they most clubs don't provide anything like that, and they say they don't, and that's because of COVID restrictions. But that equally, that was also before, um, you know, before these restrictions were li lifted and before people were allowed back in. I can't comment on what that. You know what the situation is in terms of fans, because I just don't know. I'm afraid, but I mean, okay. Ian is Ian is you know Ian is absolutely and totally right that um, you know it's not it's not an ownership at the club that are interested in making a uh, a fuss about Newcastle fans because they don't you know they're they're not bothered they're not bothered about that it's gone way beyond it because you know he wants out and so um, you know if we're looking for that kind of stuff we're absolutely looking in the in the wrong place. I mean, one yeah. thing that. Just to take this back to the sort of whole Super League thing briefly, I don't know if you're about to mention this, Charlotte, so maybe I'm jumping in. But but it's sort of what what I found uh, very very interesting about that was how not only how quickly they all folded, but how very quickly they then offered supporter representation. Some of them certainly Spurs have done it. Did Man United do it as well? Um, I can't remember. But but the point is that that reaction was to ordinary people protesting and saying not good enough and yeah there was a massive political backlash and there was a backlash from the other clubs and from uefa and from the premier league and so on and so forth but really it was that visceral angry uh response from all of football including the fans of those own clubs to say no this will not stand this does not stand and all i'm saying is that this you know the pitch is exactly about that it's just about saying that this is your club we have to do this for ourselves because nobody else is going to do it for you. Mike Ashley is not going to do it for you. He doesn't care. And so let's see this, seize this moment to do something. We're at a very interesting uh, time in terms of 
football and govern governance and i just you know i think we i think we have a moment to seize but we have to seize it ourselves i totally agree and and that is sort of the basis and the foundation of of the 1892 pledge scheme and um and what we're trying to do you know there's been all kinds of fan protests and i support everybody's right to protest in whatever way that they want to i think that's part of the beauty of the country that we live in and that's absolutely everybody's prerogative but the thing that i think and you might not agree with me the thing that i think um is so special about the pledge scheme is that it's it's a positive sort of um it's a positive act active way of of trying to do something different of trying to set yourself up for the future i think um it's easy to sort of to, to get to a position where you know a lot of people say well you want us to be relegated because some of our animations say um what if we drop down the leagues absolutely not i'm delighted we're staying up i'm not delighted that we're probably going to see more of the same turgid football next um next season but i'm delighted we're staying up someone will buy the club if it's in the premier league fine we have perhaps a smaller state but if they're open to talking to us that's so exciting and that's so that's so promising um koska who is um the person who was um tino's um Interpreter says Liverpool announced yesterday they're setting up a supporters board. Really interesting, and and I think that sort of thing is um, what we want to be seeing. Um, but I also am I'm very wary of it just being optics and lip service and it really doing nothing. Ian, <clears throat> I know that you've kind of talked about this fan led review, which was in the Conservative Party manifesto last year, and. Um, they have now set up in the wake of the Super League and the Big Six and stuff. But I know one of your main concerns, and perhaps it has been alleviated. Was that a, it's been a long stream. I don't know if that's the right word. But um, one of your main concerns was whether or not this actually is a real fan-led review into football. Um, have you had any more on that? Do you do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I do know. Yes, I mean. In, in Parliament, I, I helped to establish and we have as the secretary at the Football Supporters Association as an as an all party group for for football supporters, and that's that's the one that I, I helped set up and chair. And and the thing is, I, I I do know that Tracy Crouch has already been in touch with the Football Supporters Association about their involvement in the fan led review. Now, how that actually works out, you know, this is very early days uh, that we'll, 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 we'll wait 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 to see but at the moment that sounds like an optimistic sort of overture to the football supporters association which is the sort of umbrella uh, group for all the fan fan groups around the country so that that that's positive um but i i, I still have an overriding concern that you know and, and this is nothing against tracy crouch herself I, I you know i think she's a genuine a genuine person um she is a she's a tottenham fan she is a fan and I'm just concerned that from the go from the government from Boris Johnson's perspective, that having her as chair of the view means that it's fan led, and and that wouldn't be deep enough for me. It wouldn't be broad enough for me in terms of that inclusivity that needs to happen in terms of bringing in fans groups to properly oversee a real review of the governance of football because it's quite it's quite clear. We've only got to look at what's been happening, not just in the Premier League, not just with the Super League, but in the English Football League as well, in terms of the governance of clubs at all levels, there's been some real questions to be asked. And it's proved conclusively that the game and the current administration of the game can't properly govern itself. And therefore, there, there may well be a requirement for um, additional outside regulatory body to oversee it. because. Um, you know, unfortunately, clubs are going to the wall, particularly in the English Football League below Premier League level. Um, clubs are massively in debt, overspending on an epic scale. I mean, I think I think the Championship uh, last last year uh, on on players' wages alone spent something like 110 percent of gross revenue, and that's just bonkers. You know, just that is crazy. 
Yeah. Well, well, I saw I saw a thing um, this week. Was it a petition? Uh, if you're watching and you want to correct me, go right ahead. I love to be corrected. Um, there was something about um, uh, an independent arbitrator. Um, somebody, Steve H, has said, "Howie, sorry, just to just to say, um, it was known last September that there wouldn't be any catering tea, coffee pies. That was down to the government, not Ashley. Well, a lot has changed since last September. Ian's Ian's shaking his head, and Ian's in the government, so maybe that's I'm not, not in the government. I'm in I'm in the opposition, as a matter of fact. But but I mean, but I mean I, yeah, I'm an, I'm an MP. Parliament. But the, but the, but the thing is, you know, um, as of last um, Monday." You know, pubs were able to open indoors with social distancing, restaurants as well. And I don't think football club concourses were precluded from that. OK, that, that's fair. I think the wider point, like we're getting a little bit stuck on pies not being available or tea not being available. But the wider point is that fans aren't thought of or, you know, it wasn't made clear to fans that that wouldn't be the case um, and things like that. And, and that's what we want to that's what we want to change. We just want to be, you know, we want to be thought of and we want to be involved in the conversation. Um, but yes, there was a there was a petition this week about um, appointing an independent arbit arbitrator of the Premier League, which was quite interesting. I think did Gary Lineker tweet that? Um, George, you might know a bit more about it. You're <clears> nodding anyway. Yeah, it was Gary Lineker and Gary Neville and and others um, uh, started. Yeah, started started all that going and got the ball got the ball rolling with that. So, I so think I think it's up to a hundred thousand people already. Up to a hundred thousand yeah. people. On that's the amazing. They have to debate it then, don't they? At a hundred thousand. Yeah, that's but, awesome. Yeah, that, it's 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 not the be all and end all. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm afraid to say I, I know something about the machinery of how this works because. The, the committee which which determines which petitions get debated actually sprang out of a committee I've chaired for the last five years, which is the backbench business committee. That's neither here nor there. But um but so so once a petition on the government website reaches a hundred thousand signatures, it then has to be determined by the, the petitions committee and they'll uh, arrange for it, I'm afraid to say only a 90 minute debate in the secondary chamber called Westminster Hall. But at least then once a debate of that nature takes place, there has to be a government minister there to give a formal government governmental response. So, so that's that's interesting. And I and I think you know going back to the, the point um, about the in the the the, the, the final ed review, you know we we wrote as the all party group back in November to, to the prime minister saying when are you going to bring forward proposals for the all party uh, review? We got a response from Nigel Huddleston I think back in February who was the sports minister, to say, well, you know, it's not in, in this current session. We might bring something forward um, in the Queen's speech. Queen's speech was just last week, by the way. But, of course, what also happened was the, the, the Super League thing kicked off in late that. Once they saw the, the, once they saw the response to the Super League uh, uh, across the press, the media, and uh, across fans uh, uh, across the country, that was immediately the knee-jerk reaction was, oh, we've got a thing in the, in the box here, the fan-led review, and out it came. You know, so they had no plans to pursue it massively or quickly, uh, but th that precipitated that action. So th th it's funny that the big six, as they call themselves, might have done us a favour. Yes, this this is true. This is true, and it came at just the right time in in terms of um in terms of you know I'm going to keep looping this back to the pledge as a trust event. This is a pledge event. We are all three of us, or four of us. There's four of us again. Long night. Um, just to uh, just to reiterate, George, Ian, Warren, and another man, um, Lee Humble, are the guardians of the money. The money that you put into the 1892 pledge is looked after by them. They make sure that it is not being used for anything other than um, its intended use, which is to hopefully buy a stake, a fan stake in Newcastle United, or in the very worst case scenario, uh, they will vote on sending it to local northeast based charities uh fingers crossed we won't we won't get to that point obviously charities very worthy cause won't be unhappy if that is the case but um but uh fingers crossed we do we do get a uh a say eventually that would just be nice wouldn't it um but i think that's the the really interesting thing we had a surge in donations when um and and pledges when that um 
the Super League was announced because it just highlights, doesn't it, how much uh, it's getting the game is being run away with by rich owners who aren't in touch with the fans, who aren't in touch with the communities. And the communities are such uh, an important part of, of, of a football club. Uh, you know, we've said it before. Why is why is Newcastle United worth three hundred and fifty million quid or three hundred and five plus the debt or what, whatever it is? It, it's because of the fan base. You're buying a fan base. You're buying you're buying a potentially massive fan base if you want to actually advertise and and push into like America or Latin America or China, etc. But you're buying a fan base that is 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 so rooted in its community, in its club. And and Warren, you'll know this from your time here. I mean, it's it's so stark to me listening to you talk about the club and why you got involved with the pledge because you're not from here, but you played here and you felt that like I say here, um, I'm in the but I'm moving home. Um, <laughs> you, you felt that like that 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 passion and community, right? Yeah, I mean, touching back to what Alan was saying, who was earlier on uh, to have Alan Shearer to to be part of the the, the scheme and the pledge. Um, you know, within 20 minutes of it being launched, he he was supporting it. Uh, Keith Gillespie, Rob Lee, Steve Howie, and the list goes on and on and on of people that supported it. Uh, deck as well so we've had lots of people supporting the pledge and fans um, and it all goes back to the fans you know when I went to the club from in 1995 from London moving up there it was ingrained in me pretty early about how important it is to represent Newcastle United if I didn't know it already and I've told the story before when I was you know doing a call down after one of my games for London and hearing the roar of the fans and being around and you know, saying to my old teammates then mad playing for this lot in playing for for Newcastle, you know, five months later, I am doing that. And um, to know how important it is to the people, and as I said, me and Keith, you know, to have that responsibility to embrace that, to have that power that if we do well on a Saturday or a Sunday or a Monday, that they've got the chance to have a good weekend and to, to enjoy their week at work, working hard Monday to Friday. So it's ingrained to me, and, you know, through Kevin Keegan to Bobby Robson, uh, players at the club, but also... I touched on when I did the, uh, an interview with George, it was a big part of my life, you know, my family, you know, how well the people was friendly to me. And not just because I played for Newcastle, but because they were generally nice people and friendly people and wanted you to enjoy being in the North East, enjoy being part of their, their community, a part of their their uh, families and inviting you in to, to have a drink with them or have dinner with them or just to talk to them on the streets. And, for for me, it was it was so refreshing, and it's ingrained in me, and it's part of me now. Of that, it means so much. It could be quite easy for me over here, just to you know, every now and again, put a bit on the social media. Yeah, I support, but I felt the club looked weak and vulnerable, and looked on the floor. And I, that's not the club that I I played for. That's not the club I represented, and the club that I was captain for. So that's why I wanted to be part of it. And it is unusual that you've got someone from London that you know is is behind the club but it, it's it's part of me it's part of my life it's a big big part of me and my wife being married living up there with the kids and and everything else and we've got so many good friends up there and so many people that i uh keep in contact with and it's a club that you know it's an old cliche but i do love it i love the club i love the fans i miss going to st james's hearing the roar and the excitement you just sense the electricity in the air when you go in there and we ain't had that for a long long time and that's why i want to like this, and that's why I'm proud when I hear eighty-five thousand pounds in the cut, you know, in the pandemic that's been raised in a month. People that are getting twenty-three thousand every month supporting it. You know, we don't want to run the club. We want a voice that you know listens to Ian about you know, can we do this a little better? Can we help out? What 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 does it mean to be part of Newcastle? What does it mean to be a fan of the club? And you either get it, or unfortunately, you don't. And if you don't get it, it's your loss because it's such a such a fantastic place to be around you know I'd, I'd leave the sunshine tomorrow to be part of the football club but that ain't gonna happen so i just enjoy my sunshine so a lot of people <laughs> asking if you'll come back and be manager warren so careful what you wish for it's yeah. a lot more rainy in newcastle well pe be careful what you wish for with me it, it'll be fun whatever <laughs> happens it'll be fun <laughs> but the, we'll the, 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 the the word you use there warren i mean you know you're 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 absolutely 100 percent part of part of us 
and the, the, the that word is us the word is us because Newcastle isn't Mike Ashley and it's not Steve Bruce it's not the players it's not you know it's not it's not Lee Chandley it's us it's all of us George, it's all of well. us and I'm proud of that you know what I mean I'm I, I feel proud to be part of that you know of that time that people that area it's not just oh okay I, when people say that to me one of us that means something to me because I know what it's like to be a, you know, I know what they love being a Geordie and how much they love their, their area and their people and the club. So when people say that, I take that with pride because it means something. It's not just a flippant comment because, you know, when you go there, you're just one of the players and they, they like you to buy a shirt, whatever it is in the past. But when they say you're one of them, like he would say, that means something, George. That means something to Rob Lee. That means something to Speedo, to Shay. To out, well, I was one of you anyway, but you know, it means something to them because it, it's genuine. It, and that we understand what that means to be accepted as being one of them. That's a big, big thing. So, you I mean, a, a club, you know, a club, it's, but that's that's the point. A club, I say this countless times, I say this over and over again a club is a collection of people, and that those people again are us, they're us. And so, you know, I. I to go back to the Super League sort of thing, you, in my naivety, I kind of thought that, you know, you get through a year of pandemic and no fans in stadiums. And so perhaps there would be this recalibration, you know, in football to actually see how important fans are to the whole experience. And 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 the club would sort of recognise, you know, would recognise something and, and, and look to do something to sort of recognise that. And they did do something. They they ignore their own fans even more. You know, I'm talking about the so-called big six, or in the case of Tottenham, that's quite laughable. Um, but um, no, no offense. Um, but um, you know, the they they ignored their own fans even more, and they chased the money. And so, if football is us, if a club is us, if a club is people, then I'm afraid it's up to those people to try and do something better because we know Mike Ashley doesn't care. You know, we just know he doesn't care and he wants out. And so, you know, we do have to do things for ourselves. A lot of the time that feels that feels hopeless. It feels very difficult. But, you know, we started something with this pledge scheme. Um, I think it's really valuable. I think it's really important. I think it's so, in, so important to remind people that this club is their club. And, you know, let's see how far we can go with it. Huge thank you to everybody who's who's obviously played so far. But this is what it's about. It's about us. It's about Warren. It's about Ian. It's about Charlotte. It's about everybody who's watching. It's about us coming together and doing it for ourselves because no bugger is going to do it for us. Absolutely. And that sort of feels like the right kind of note to end it on. Uh, we've done two hours of chats. I can't really believe it. Um, is there anything anybody's desperate to to say? I'm going to clap us out with another one of our wonderful animations. Um, but uh, all right, you know what? We're playing on Sunday. Let's let's round out with a prediction, um, and uh, and I'll let everybody go and have their have their evenings. Um, we've had so many comments as well, by the way. And if I haven't read out your comment or if I haven't put it on the screen, I'm so sorry. I'm seeing most of them. I think it's so incredible. I love seeing people that have pledged. I love seeing people chatting to each other about their first games. That's been a very nice little thread down there. That's been lovely. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Thank you if you've stayed the whole time. But uh, if you, you, you know, this will be up on uh, the Trust channel. So dip in and out. Uh, enjoy it over the next uh, next few days. Um, Ian, Fulham, Newcastle, what is going to be the score? Well, it's Newcastle and George, and George will be familiar with this. Uh, I'm afraid to say because it's Newcastle over the last number of seasons, I've come to expect now and anything we get is a bonus. All right, okay. Uh, George, do you want to go next? Well, I'm so incredibly de delighted it's not the um, end of season shoot shootout, uh, relegation shootout that we all uh, suspected a few weeks ago. Um, I was there a couple of years ago when uh, we won very, very handsomely and there were all those pissed Jodies in that flotilla on the Thames, which was just, <laughs> oh, including you, Ian, well done. Uh, should have known, should have guessed. Um, but, and just an absolutely brilliant sort of occasion that was sort of tinged with a little bit of, uh, you know, sadness and worry, obviously, about Rafa's future. Um, 
be nice to have that again. I don't suppose that'll happen. I'm going to be positive. I'll say Newcastle to win 2 All right, I'll take it. Uh, Warren, you positive as well? I'm positive. Um, so I'm going to go. But, and I like Scotty Parker, as I said. Not only because he was obviously one of the players. I like to be a draw. So that's, you know, let's go down. Uh, as as a draw, let him get a bit of satisfaction. Um, but I go back to, again to what what we say. It seems that the club and the, the coaching staff are delighted that we finish at the relegation zone, which is yeah. is sad. I mean, let that sink in a little bit that we're delighted. And Alan touched it, you know, at the beginning to say that the manager's brief at the beginning was to stay up, and everybody seems now it's high fives everywhere. We've done a Surely our football club is worth more than that. Surely if you know you're in charge of a club and got players that you you want more from that. Just hopefully we have a, a great summer and it's been a tough year for many, many reasons. Um, but things like this has given a bit of positivity. It's made me feel part of the club again uh, with the fans, uh, which I haven't felt. I've not had any contact with the, fan, with the club. Uh, so this has made me feel part of it and something that I've, uh, I'm proud to be involved with. Getting to know, you know, people again, old friends and new friends. So hopefully this can continue. But I, as I said, it's a, it's an honour. Um, if we can get a point, that'd be even better. But surely we want better for our club than, than yeah, surviving. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just a cup of tea. It's not just a cup of tea and a pie, is it? Let's let's get back into no. Europe. Let's go and yeah. challenge Europe. Let's take a, you know, six seven thousand people to to Paris or somewhere. Let's go and have some well, fun. Well, but Warren, all we want to do is to compete. That's all we want to do, to compete, to have a chance. But, you know, going into so many games when you're just thinking we're going to get some more negativity and if we set up for a draw, the best we can get is a draw. And if we if it goes wrong, you know, we've got... We're, we're, we've seen it this season all too many times when it's stuff starts going wrong on the pitch. They just didn't seem to know how to change it. And in the last seven or eight games... They've shown us what could have happened mm -hmm. if they played like yeah. that for the whole of the season. Totally, can totally I, good. Yes, George? Can, just very, very quickly, can I speak for absolutely everybody who is watching this? I know I am. I would follow Warren into battle. I really would. Yeah, I hope, yeah. I hope I never have to do that, but I really, I genuinely would. Warren. You're an absolute, <laughs> you're, a, you're, a, you're an absolute legend. <laughs> You are. You're rallying the troops. There is so much love for you in the comments today. There's been so much love for Alan. There's been so much love for Keith. There is love for all three of you. George, Ian and Warren, thank you so much for joining me this evening. Uh, thank you for such insightful, interesting, funny and fun chat <laughs> in all in support of the 1892 pledge scheme. Please, if you're watching and you haven't even checked out the website, go and have a look. It's a lovely website. It's 1892pledge.co.uk. UK. Um, if you have pledged, we thank you so much. If you have pledged one off and you want to have another go, go for it. If you want to change that into a monthly, we fully encourage that. Join thousands of other Newcastle United fans who are pledging their money to make a difference to their club. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, what's the word? Play us out on one of our videos um, featuring Norman Riley, one of the True Faith contributors, and his brother. Thank you so much, everybody, for sticking with us. Uh, take care, and uh, how are you, the lads, for Sunday? Thank you, Charlotte. Sure. Thank you. Super Mac. Andy Cole. Old Jackie. Mickey Quinn. Best striker at St. James Park, no doubt. How am I not this again? Mickey Quinn never played for in the first division. What's the crack with his pledge scheme, then? Who's behind it? How am I, man? You must have heard about it. You're not on Twitter. Aye, but I need to watch the Mickey Quinn goals. Do you know how many goals he scored for the tune? It's a support us trust behind the scheme. What they're saying is that when the club's sold, we need to be ready to buy your shane it. Oh, aye. Aye. How will it do that then, mate? It'll be kind of pricey, that ain't. No, it's a long-term project. You can do your direct debit to hire in as much as you want. So is the idea to get thousands of fans paying a little to save a lot? Spot on. The club should be run for us. An elected fan representative is working with you and us to make sure we're never getting this kind of mess again. Has anyone else ever tried this way? Loads have done it to save their clubs. Hearts have raised 11 and a half million doing this exact same scheme, pledging little each month, and they're about to buy their club. Wow, that's class. How much do the trust want to raise them? Few million quid at least, but they also want to be ready if we get relegated and relegate again like the Mackhams did, with Nee Harmon being prepared. Right. What's the card again? The 1892 pledge. Just get on the website. Dead easy. Sound. What happens if it doesn't work though? 
like if Ashley never sells or the new lot aren't interested then all the money raised will be given to local charities and they've appointed four gadgets to look after the money for them so worst case scenario I'm a couple of quid a month going to charity then aye best case is we want a little bit of the club if it's sold in the prem or a larger part of with the elites aye oh, you can count me in then think it's due for a ten a month we have to agree on one thing mint away then Whoa, Mickey wow, Quinn man. Newcastle's number nine and then the other they even fit the lacy boots well you haven't mentioned Sir Les so it didn't start that again get yourself pledged then we'll talk fair enough mate 1892pledge.co.uk aye aye get in mate tell your mates Keegan Keegan